So uh, welcome everybody to the first 2021 um, ISC Squared Lunch and Learn. I appreciate everybody's attendance. And we'll just go over a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, please make sure that your uh, microphones are muted. I think we have one person that does not have their microphone muted right now uh, during the presentation, just so we don't hear any background noise. Um, we have uh, Bruce Funk will be taking the attendance and we'll pull, be polling the attendees uh, to make sure that everybody gets their uh, credit uh, for the CPEs. And then a copy of the present, like I said, the start of recording the presentation right now. So a, a copy of the recording will be available on the website after this um, for reference, for future reference. And after the presentation, we'll generate the attendance report um, to make sure that everybody gets their CPEs. And if you don't, please reach out to us to make sure, and then we'll make sure that you, everybody gets credit for their attendance. Um, so today's presentation, uh, will be conducted by uh, Mr. Andrew Smith, um, and it's uh, in regards to social engineering, the risks and what it's cost. If uh, I'd like to just read off his uh, bio uh, quickly, just to um, let everybody know the, um, a little bit about Mr. Smith and his expertise in the field. So Mr. Smith is a career cybersecurity practitioner with 27 years of experience in the military, government, and private sectors. Mr. Smith is currently the cybersecurity branch chief and the ISSO for the U.S. Army Europe USARA, USARA AF Mission Partner MPE Network Division. He is a member of the Deutschland Austria Switzerland Chief Information Security Officers Council and served on the Secure CISO Advisory Board for Denver, Colorado, was an IT supervisor for the U.S. Attorney's Office, served as the re, uh, regional IT lead for the DEA Europe, Africa, Asian Division, and was the Information Security Office for the U.S. State Department of the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok, Thailand. Mr. Smith has worked as an advanced persistent threat assessor, system administrator, SharePoint designer, application developer, network engineer, and satellite technician, which have all contributed to a depth of understanding and in information technology security across all layers of the OSI models. So uh, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Andrew Smith, and we hope you all enjoy his presentation. All right, so right give now, me a second while we reshare this. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing and allow him to share. So just give us a brief moment. Crying, evidently, <laughs> having a heart attack. <laughs> I hear you, Andrew. <laughs> All right, here we go. Tell me if you guys can see the screen when it pops up. Yes. Victory. All right. Yay. Practice does work. <laughs> it's still so. blank for me. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, ISC Square reaching out to me to give this presentation. Um, so we're going to talk today about social engineering and the cost of what it has on organizations. Um, my experience, of course, is with USRA and our mission over here in Europe. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about actually can be can be related to you know pretty much any organization in the IT domain. All right. So what is well, why do we care? Why do we care? What you know? Why, why do we care as cybersecurity professionals about the risks and costs of social engineering? Well, as, uh, as our operational terrain increasingly moves into the digital environment, 
uh, especially with the greater reliance of teleworking due to COVID. We see a shift of, you know, from the internal, you know, uh, from the initial warfighter engagement uh, domain transitioning from the traditional physical kinetic uh, areas and moving into the cyber domain where adversary engagements, you know, are constantly attempting to degrade and deter our ability to effectively communicate as uh, modern military forces. Um, with, with that greater exposure to the digital domain, we not only, you know, uh, create an you know, ease of communicating between authorized organizations and users, but it also means a greater exposure of this information to malicious actors that are out there looking to steal our information for either in, information gathering, you know, criminal financial uh, purposes, um, you know, spreading mis or disinformation in order to negatively impact the credibility of uh, our missions as a U.S. military or, you know, organizations and, the, and their interests globally. Um, you know, the social engineering threat applies to any organization that houses data, uh, you know, or any information that has a, that is of value to someone. You know, these compromises can affect, you know, can can be felt across the entire cross section of the digital media users. You know, this could be, you know, the commercial organizations, national defense industries, uh, partner nations, uh, as well as you know, you know, we'll see collateral damage of you know, victims, you know, families and friends and any other users that, you know, uh, uh, previously identified, you know, that I was talking about the national defense guys, you know, as a society, our digital footprints have become our identity. And the information of that identity, uh, if not properly protected, can be used, you know, can be extremely damaging to you know, individuals and organizations. So how much is this compromise of information costing society? From 2015 to 2019, you know, we saw an annual global cost of cybercrime raise from $3 trillion a year annually to $5 trillion. That's a 60% increase over a four-year period. While that may be, seem like a staggering number in itself, projections indicate that by the year 2025, again, a four-year period, that's that Cybercrime impact is going to total is going to have an annual total uh, cost uh, of approximately 10.5 trillion dollars. That's a 110 percent increase annually to what it what you know to what it costs today. If you average that out across the you know every inhabitant on the planet Earth, it comes out to about 1,500 dollars per person. So, so in light of you know how much it costs in the global markets, you know. And, and you know how much do you guys think we're spending globally on cybersecurity? So this is kind of an interactive uh, brief. So you know if you ha you know I'm going to ask questions throughout. So feel free to jump in if you guys you know, as I ask the question. So so how much do you guys think we spend annually on, on cybersecurity? Any takers? It depends on what you're counting. Whether you're going to count the people salaries, like if so, they're. I'm talking total you know annual I, costs of organizations across the board. Global annual costs. How much do you think we, as a as a global defensive, you know, network of cybersecurity professionals? Less than ten percent of uh, current losses. Actually, we spent one trillion dollars cumulatively over that same from 2017 to 2021. We spent one trillion dollars. It's about 250 billion dollars a year. That's 2.3% of our losses. So that just gives you an idea of, you know, how big of an impact cybercrime has and how little we are actually doing to defend against it. So that, you know, it, which then look, you know, which then rolls into how much harder our job as cyber defenders is. So we looked at, you know, if we look at projected costs for 2021, Cybersecurity Ventures predicts that the cost of cybercrime will will be about $6 trillion this year. If you do the breakdown, that comes out to $190,000 a second that we are losing to cyber, you know, to, to cyber compromise. How big is that? Well, if we were to equate cyber crime as an independent nation on the global market, they would have a $6 trillion of net worth, which represents the third wealthiest nation on the planet. Oh, only beaten by the U.S. and China. So you can see why criminals find this as a profitable market. You know, you know, 
I mean, the amount of money that they are they are stealing from the from the global markets is an amazing amount when you look at it in these numbers. So what are the risks? Well, we're gonna I'm gonna go through a the top three cyber risks that you know we see here within the user of theater. So first risk, of course, is human nature. You know, whether it's malicious, you know, whether you know whether it's uh, you know whether it's with or without malice, the, you know, people or the human factor are the biggest threat to cybersecurity. The number one, you know, the number one risk, you know, in the human nature is you know, what we refer to as the insider threat. You know, recently there was a study done by SecurityIntelligence.com that showed that 60% of data breaches are caused by insider threats. That 60%, and that was for 2019, and that was a 47% over the numbers that they that that were uh, uh, figured out in 2018. So from 2018 to 2019. We jumped from about 30 percent to uh, about 60, uh, from 31 percent to 60 percent, which is about 47 percent increase. Uh, detecting the insider threat is extremely problematic, uh, you know, from from it for security teams because the insider threat is already has legitimate access to our organization's information, our assets. Uh, and distinguishing a user's normal activity between that of potential malicious activity is is the challenge. You know, hackers are frequently using social engineering or you know, human hacking to leverage the insider threat because they find it much more cost effective and less resource laden than using other logical or uh, you know, pro uh, programmatic uh, tactics to get that information. You know, when we look at insider threats, you know, we can generalize them into four flavors. We have what's called referred to as the pawn, which is an employee with you know with that is manipulated into performing malicious activity, typically through phishing and social engineering. And then we have the goof, you know, uh, the user that doesn't, you know, have that doesn't have malicious intent, but rather takes a deliberate and you know, you know uh, and potentially harmful actions on the network due to his ignorance or arrogance to the applicability of you know security policies, you know, and up to them as a user, you know, like you've got. We've all seen it, you know, you've got office chiefs that are like, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, that, that's what we refer to as the goof. And we've got the collaborator. The collaborator are users that, you know, cooperate with third parties, oftentimes, you know, competitors or, or nation state actors, and to use their, their privileged access into a system as a way to intentionally cause harm to an organization. Uh, typically, these are the folks that do it for uh, financial Gain um, nationalistic ide ideas, idealization. So they, you know, those are the ones that those. These are the you know we're rolling into the malicious guys now. Then we got the lone wolf, you know, independent person. Act, you know, he's acting maliciously with you know, w without external influences or manipulations. This is the this is the guy from the office space with the red swing line stapler. He's going to burn the place down, you know, because he's you know he, he's upset, so he wants to impact uh, the organization in a negative way. So those are our four flavors of, of insider threats. An insider threat is the number one risk that we see globally to organizations. So how will we combat the insider threat or the human condition? You know, the number one most effective solution is to educate, uh, educate our users you know, uh, through, uh, through periodic in informational user awareness training, um, we can also restrict access, you know, to possible attack platforms such as social media, you know, professional networking sites, uh, by employing a zero trust model on, our, on websites through firewalls, uh, using robust uh, access and permission controls with uh, concentrations on the need to know, you know, um, you know, limiting their free movement, you know, so we can limit free movement on the network uh, to areas that, you know, the workers are supposed to be in, and limiting them from areas that are not related to their duties ensures that you know the organization users you know we ensure that they they understand the uh the training of you know how to you know we need to know how to, how to report insider threats uh oops, went too far sorry <laughs> uh, okay sorry um so we you know using access controls get it, and then making sure that they understand how to use the insider threat reporting program um most organizations have a program in place. I know USERA has one. Um, large organizations usually have one. If you see something, report it. So making sure that our users have access to those venues, making sure that you know they have easy ways to 
to report, you know, um, anonymously. You know, most you know, if you give them an option to report anonymously, you're going to get a lot more people using those programs. So those are all ways that we can help combat the risk of the human nature. Um, I referred to a, uh, earlier, you know, a couple of examples of social media and professional platforms. So question number two, who can give me, let's say, two examples of social media sites and two examples of professional networking sites? Anyone? Social media like Facebook, you mean? Or? Hey, there you go. There's one, Facebook. Okay. What's another one? Twitter. Um, like LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. LinkedIn would be a good professional networking site, right? X I N G is a German. Zing. That's a good one. Yep. Most people don't get that one. Good job. Yeah. So those are, you know, so you guys understand that those are your sites that, you know, by having those kind of access, free access to your users and stuff, you open yourself to the potential insider threat. You know, um, and you know that that that's a preferred method of hackers is to utilize social media platforms in order to identify and target their you know their 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 victims. All right. So risk number two that we see is malware. You know. It, Malware is a truly insidious, it's an insidious threat. It can be distributed through multiple delivery methods. Um, in some cases, you know, it, you know, it, it's a ma in some cases, it's a, a master of disguise. You know, you know, they're hard to find. You know, they, uh, you know some types of malware. You know, they're known as adaptive malware, uh, such as you know polymorphic or metamorphic malware. Uh, they you know, they can change their very genetic makeup, their coding itself, then, you know, morph into something else that, you know, can can uh, subvert the scanners that are out there. You know, um, what do we got here? We got, uh, there's numerous types of, uh, of malware, you know, types, versions, attack methodologies, you know, payload delivery systems. You know, we can, you know, we can, the, you know, these are some of the possible uh, types. You know, we've got ransomware, spyware, adware, worms, trojans, rootkits, keystroke loggers, logic bombs. I mean, the list goes on and on. So, you know, trying to protect against that sheer number, you know, it's like that, that's that's a that's an impossible task on itself that we have to do for every day as our as cybersecurity practitioners. Um, so, you know, so how do we, you know? How do we protect against stuff like that? Oh, sorry, malware facts. Here's a couple of facts that I thought were fun facts for the to share with the audience. Um, you know, currently there's 98% of cellular-based malware that targets uh, Android devices. Does that mean iPhones are more secure? Absolutely not. In 2019, Mac OS malware, uh, the malware itself increased almost 165%. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of of, disco of, of uh, discovered mobile malware has been host is hosted on third-party app stores. Um, you know, ninety-two uh, percent of malware is delivered in email. You know, so know where you're getting your apps from. Uh, just because you click on a link in an email does not guarantee that you're being provided you know, that application from Google Play or the Apple i Store. You know, it's very easy for malicious actors to generate convincing dummy store sites. So, I mean, Trojans make up 50% uh, of all malware. So, you know, the old, you know, Trojan horse, you know, just because it looks good on the outside, it's what's on the inside that counts. Um, cellular phones represent a significant threat. And the reason I give these numbers is because cellular phones represent a significant threat to us here at the US, uh, in, within the U.S. Army and Europe. I'm sure it's the same across the board to other organizations. Um, we see in, in Europe, we see multiple cybersecurity violations um, each week. Of those that we capture, 90% or greater are due to users plugging their cell phones into the user networks. So simple education, uh, you know, simple education uh, um, um, programs can, can teach our users what is right. And, you know, being on top of that and, you know, identifying that, you know, hey, you know, this is not home. Your, your, your 
computers are not cell phone chargers. So we just need to get those messages out there, and we'll see a dramatic increase on the number of breaches on networks just by doing that alone. <clears throat> so, oh, sorry, I printed two pages on that one. Uh, so recommended solutions, again, Use reputable antivirus and uh, anti-malware uh, solutions, and point protection. And you know, use your endpoint protection solutions to to monitor all of your uh, workstations on the network. You know, for any kind of you know malicious code or malicious activity. Uh, email spam filters. You know, endpoint security. I said uh, ensuring uh, you know that ensure your cybersecurity updates are patched. You know, um, your IAVMs, your Microsoft Tuesdays, all those things. Make sure that you are on top of those things. Make sure that your network teams and your inform and your your, um, your your server teams, those guys are out there weekly looking for those updates, scanning their systems for vulnerabilities, plugging those holes. You know, um, and again, we come back to the you know annual training for users. Can't emphasize this enough. You'll hear me repeat on this throughout this entire presentation. Education is our is the number one thing we can do to combat this threat. You know, and limit you know limit the access to application you know privileges. You now again, using robust access control systems, using permissioning, using you know uh, you know um, uh, firewalls, folder you know folder uh, you know uh, seg uh, isolating people to the stuff they need, keeping them out of the stuff they don't need the need to know. You know, by exercising that need to know model and the zero trust model for websites, you know, those are big. A lot of organizations are like, well, we need to get access to this. We need to get access to that. The more access you grant to your users, the more susceptible your networks are going to be to a breach. So just because people need access doesn't mean, just because people want access doesn't mean they need access. So with each request, it should be reviewed and there should be a wait presented to it and you know have you know have somebody of authority granting that access so just things to, to keep in mind as we move through this <clears throat> so number three risk phishing and social media can't talk about social engineering without talking about phishing <laughs> you know these are very real very costly cybersecurity threats you know but you know you know you know, it costs. We lose approximately seventeen thousand seven hundred dollars every minute, based on a study done by Risk IQ, to phishing attempts and social media, you know, social media compromises. Um, you know, what is you know, I, this presentation was kind of written for more of the layman. I was, you know, I could go and say, ask, you know, what is what is phishing? We all know what phishing is, but in a nutshell, phishing is the fraudulent attempt. To elicit, you know, the, the I should say the def, the, the de, uh, textbook definition is a fraudulent attempt to elicit sensitive information from a victim in order to perform some type of action, whether it is to gain access to a network or accounts, gain access to data, or get the victim to perform an action such as wire transfers. So that's the definition, and the cost is, you know, it, it costs, you know, seventeen thousand plus a minute. Um, if you calculate that out in the calendar year. That's about $9.3 billion a year it is costing, you know, industry just in phishing. Now, um, there's numerous types of phishing attacks. You know, we've got, you know, you know, generalized phishing, you know, spear phishing, whale phishing, smishing, which is phishing with SMS, vishing, which is, you know, voicemail phishing. Um, We've got social. You know, we've got social phishing, which is across your social media sites. Domain spoofing, URL phishing, water holing, you know, evil twin phishing. So I mean, these are all different types. There's a number of other ones. These are just a couple that I pulled out just as an example. However, you know, whatever type of phishing attack is employed, almost all phishing activities frequently involve the use of social engineering tactics. You know, they get in your head. They call you up. Hey, I'm your, I'm so and so from here. You know, give me access because I'm trying to do this. So we just have to let our users know what what to look for. The hard part with that is, it, it, it's all about training and it's all about identifying. So here's some fun facts about phishing. Seventy-six percent of organizations were phished in the year in 2019. So does anybody have an idea? Uh, question here, another question. 
Anybody have any idea of uh, how many of those started with an email, percentage-wise? All of them? Close. 91% of phishing attacks reported started, with, started via a phishing email. That's, you know, Digital Guardian said that 75% uh, of, organization, of organizational users could not properly identify a phishing email. So if you get 90% of your attacks via phishing email and 97% of your workforce doesn't know what a phishing email looks like, now you know why there's 75% of organizations have been victims of phishing attacks. <laughs> that is a really high number. That is a really great success rate for the adversary. Um, so what is non-email phishing? Is it like getting a text message? It could be any. It could be any one of those, uh, either a smishing or a vishing attempt or waterholing or you know it could be a number of different ways that they've you know they've actually targeted you and you know gotten information. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> um, oh, I got a fun fact. Does anybody know? How much has phishing attack? How much? How how much more prol prolific has phishing attacks increased during COVID nineteen pandemic? I'll give you guys this one. That's according to Barracuda. And according to Barracuda Network, there's been a six hundred and sixty seven percent increase in phishing attacks during COVID. That's almost seven times what we saw last. Uh, in 2019. And the reason is, it's because everybody's out there looking for information on COVID. They're, they're trying to go to any site that they can find. You know, they go to, you know, here's an email that was sent out. This is an example of a, of a COVID-19 phishing email. You know, it, it, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but, you know, on the subject line, it says, COVID-19, new case confirmed in your city. So it sparks the interest. You know, Pretty well-crafted email, says it's from the CDC Health Alert Network. But then you look at that URL, it says cdc.gov. But if you float over the URL, and I can't, you can't see it down here, but it's a, you know, uh, iplockwllc.com. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a malicious website. But people are so ramped up about COVID that they're willing to go anywhere to get any information. We are right now in a period of time where it is it is the adversaries you know uh, you know heyday right now because they can send you anything labeled COVID-19 and 97% of us will click on it <laughs> yeah when I work <clears throat> when I worked for AT&T they had a user training and they had a, a simulation uh, application where they would you would have to click um, as quickly as you could through through different whether it was uh, a, a phishing malicious URL or something like that, and then the highest uh, rated person over the time would you know they would they, it kind of it was provided an incentive because mm -hmm. you know you, you'd have like the number one person out of like so going through so many like a hundred or five hundred how many you could get through right uh, no and, and and exercises like that. Again, that's you know those are those are great incentives to educate the user base. Um, you know, give, give them a little attaboy, give them a gold, their gold star. You know, hey, you were the fastest <clears> one to get through <throat> this exercise without actually being fished. <laughs> so that's a great incentive. You know, and it's a little bragging point, people. But I mean, those are fun things that you can do with user bases and stuff, and um, it makes it a little more exciting than, okay, I'm going to flip through this 400 slide deck and read all these things and you know sit through this training. We've all done it. We've all had the annualized training that it does get monotonous time after time, but without the repeat of that and the the you know push you know basically beating that into our our users every year, we're going to have people that just forget about it. My my organization kind of does the same thing with annual training, but they also track their own progress of the training by sending out dummy phishing emails to see how people have reacted to the training and see yep. if there's been any progress in the organization. 
We do that here in USERA as well. We have a phishing campaign program that, you know, periodically, and you know, organizations within USERA can actually request this through the through the cybersecurity division at, at the G6. They, it, we can request um, the, the phishing uh, campaign to be exercised against our, you know, our individual units. And it's, you know, it's a good way to kind of see if the annual awareness training is working, if it's being effective. So those are all really good things to do. You know, having a, a phishing campaign, you know, in, or in your organization is a is an A plus. I mean, that's good. You know. Can I interject? Yeah. I think it's good to have these programs, absolutely. But when you come back with numbers and the numbers are, um, what's the word? Hi. Uh, <laughs> the numbers aren't good. There, uh, there has to be some remedial training, and that doesn't happen. And I think and that's that, where the problem is. You are is. absolutely correct, Aisha, and that's where we as an organization need to do, you know, need to fine tune those programs. You know, the programs are great yep. to have them unto themselves, but without the follow up, without the after action reporting, and without the, you know, with, without um, going back and doing those tweaks and creating that ODO loop, without those, a bit, without those, those actions, it just, it's just, you know, it's just monotonous training. But like you said, if we come back and an organization comes back with a really high fish rate, then we go back to that organization and say, hey, you guys scored 72% of your users actually clicked on this phishing email. We're not using it as attribution for, you know, for, uh, as attribution to any individual user. Like we're not going to slap, you know, slap anybody and, you know, give them a, 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 a bad boy. But as a unit, we need to say, hey, these are too high. So what are we going to do? To get these numbers down, we need to do remedial training. We need to make sure that your users understand if they can't identify a phishing email, great. Our cybersecurity professionals are going to come in and they're going to do a remedial training with your users and show them what phishing looks like. Show them what the indicators of you know are on each of these you know, on individual emails. Looking for the you know you know encrypted email lock. Looking for the, where the email's coming from. Looking floating over the the link before you actually click the link. Just doing those simple steps that are teachable can help reduce the effect of phishing. All right. Uh, all right, we go. Here we go. Sorry, I got clicked off the screen. Now it's not. Hello. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so why should we be concerned about social media? So, Social media is our number two attack vector, you know, for social engineering, as we stated before, you know, your, between your phishing and your, and your social sites and stuff. So, you know, why are we concerned from a DOD perspective? Most prolific user demographic for social media is the 18 to 20, uh, 18 to 45 um, year old group. Uh, yeah. Social media allows, you know, uh, allows employees and users to communicate faster uh it you know it moves people you know to, it it's it's allowing people to communicate faster and you know with more people than ever before in the history of mankind social media is it, it's a phenomenon it's you know this is this is how we communicate in the 21st century so but you know but what does that mean not only do people communicate faster um but it allows malicious actors to have a broader reach to potential victims. You know, instead of the cold dialing of the you know 80s and 90s where people would call you on the phone and they'd social engineer you online to try to buy something, then you get your credit card information. That was how they used to do it. They don't even have to talk to you. They don't have to talk your same language. You know, we've got people all over the world from Ukraine, Korea, Africa, Europe, you know, South America, the United States. It is it is a global problem, and you know. You don't have to speak the same language anymore. You know, we've got you go to social media site, use Google Translate. I mean, there's lots of different ways that people are trying to leverage or trying to victimize social media users for for either um, malicious intent, financial gain, intelligence gathering. So, so we just have to be aware of how easy it is, not only for us to communicate, but also for the adversary to communicate with us as vic as potential victims. You know, it social media. It, you know, we've we've adopted the fire and forget mentality when posting comments. You know, and the comments that we post out there, they could possibly contain you know confidential, protected information. 
Um, you know, it then becomes, you know, we write these emails up or we write these posts, hey, I'm going to be deployed here from such and such to such and such a day, and we send it out there. And the thing is that we have to remember the Internet is forever. It does not forget. So once the information is posted and sent, it is impossible to recall that information with 100%, you know, with 100% certainty. So, so those are the things that we just need to be aware of as we operate in the social media age. You know, you know what I said before about the most prolific user base for social media is the 18 to 45 year old group. So, the U.S. Army demographic by age. If we look at the demographic of the U.S. Army, 87 percent make up the officer corps, and 94 percent of that age group makes up the enlisted ranks. That's a total of 90.5 percent of the total Army makeup falls within that social media user demographic. So and that's why I think it's a very big concern for the Army. Now, other organizations and stuff out there, they may have, you know, usually, you know, the similar workforces are usually between the ages of 18 and 50 years old, you know, after which people start to retire. So, so it's probably very similar across the board. So we just have to, we have to understand that our primary workforce age demographic is the target audience for social media use, which means there's probably... I'd say 99.9% .9 of users in that age demographic have some social media presence somewhere on the internet. And this gives you an idea of how many, you know, users are out there. YouTube comprises, you know, YouTube has 2 billion users currently with approximately 5 billion views per day. Facebook, 1.69 billion users. LinkedIn, 675 million users. It goes on and on and on. So, fact, here's a trivia fact. How many MySpace users do you think are still out there? Anyone? There's still 50 million users on MySpace. I, I didn't realize MySpace still existed, but... Okay. MySpace still exists. There are 50 oh million God. current users. A question on that is if, if you had an account uh, years ago, and you don't even, you know what I mean? Like, even if you haven't logged in, you know, how many right. of those accounts are kind of like active zombie accounts, right? These are, these are active user accounts, according to MySpace. Uh-huh. Okay. They have 50 million active users. Yeah, it must be so, a I mean, different country because that would be one in seven people in the U.S., but how many people? No, that's globally. Still... That would be global. It's MySpace, is, is, you know, this is how many users they have globally still. These are all global numbers. So, right, I, need so to see if, some, I need to see if I can get into my MySpace account. <laughs> right? If you have a MySpace account out there now, it's the time to go out and delete it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so so those are just some interesting factoids I thought I'd throw out there. You know, as far as you know, the total reach of, so, of social media, and this doesn't you know doesn't these are just like the, the you know the the, the top uh, what do we got top eight there. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of, of minor sites that are out there that still have several million users each, um, and I didn't grab I didn't grab any of the numbers from any of the uh, Chinese-based ones. I didn't know I didn't even know what to call them to be honest. So, so I figured these are the most popular that I could pull out. Um, so, anyway, so, so we know what the risks are: one, two, and three. Three being, you know, the phishing and social media. So, how do we how do we combat this? How do we you know how do we attack, the, you know, how do we crack the nut of, you know, protecting against phishing and social media? You know, uh, we go back to, again, user awareness training, uh, ensuring that the users not only identify phishing attempts, but also where to report them. Uh, and, you know, enfor well, again, this is a DOD-centric pr uh, brief, so enforcing DOD social media use policies. Organizations out there, um, you know, should also have Social media use policies for each of the organizations. Um, you know, make sure your users are aware of those policies, and make sure that they're you know that they're they're following them. Uh, ensure the users know how to identify the phishing attempts. Um, you know, uh, enforce the use of signed encrypted emails. Again, if you're signing and you're encrypting your emails and you're looking for that little lock or that little you know signature block, you know, we just need to make sure that your users are doing all they can do 
to make sure that they're protecting not only communications that are getting in, but also the communications that are going out. Um, you know, using HTTPS on organization websites. You know, if you you know you're using you know 443 protocol on your on your internet sites, it helps to protect it. You know, you know I think most organizations now have moved to that you know, that uh, methodology. I know the DoD has a lot of large organizations are only you know building websites with 443. So. And again, we talked about you know earlier exercising uh, enterprise you know uh, you know simulated phishing campaigns. Again, we talked about that. That's a great option. And um, as we you know, log on and off of the networks, requiring two-factor authentication. So all of those things ensure you know the the ensure the identity of the users that are on the system. Um, educating the users ensure that they're treating these these risks, um, identifying them properly, reporting them properly. So so now that I've said all that, let's put it all together. You know, let's put this puzzle together and see what you know our risk factors are. So we've got cybercrime, we've got known risks, insider the insider threat, um, social media, phishing, malware. So of all these risk factors, what lies you know what you know what what lies between all these risks and the integrity and security of our organizations' networks? You guys. You guys out there as a cyber defensive workforce are the first line of defense. Working within your organizations to illuminate these risks at, at, you know, at various levels, whether it's users, administrators, leadership, you know, emphasizing that need to educate the users on periodic and continual basis and stressing the need to follow the policies and regulations, all of that will help to keep our organizations safe and defend against social engineering attacks, uh, phishing attempts, Malicious actors. So without us as a cyber as cyber you know defenders out there, you know these networks fall apart, our national defense systems fall apart, our organizations fall apart. So so we are pretty much the linchpin in all this. So kudos to everybody out there that is on this call and is out there you know doing the fight every day. So that being said, any questions? Um, Andrew, it's Ingo speaking here. Hello. Yes. Um, and again, thanks so very much. It's a very good, comprehensive overview. So uh, with very nice and interesting numbers. Um, so thanks a lot uh, for keeping us uh, uh, informed about what's going on here. But um, to fight against all these threats and risk, what is your evaluation of um, the upcoming AI, uh, you know, artificial intelligence? Um, um, yeah, technology, which is growing more and more in um, in technology, but also in organizational and policies. Um, could you state something about this? Are, are sure. you working uh, with AI-driven or AI-based technologies to counterattack uh, the various threats vectors? Right. So, so yes. So we use AI um, to do a lot of log aggregation, things like that. I think the use of AI coupled with you know our cyber with our cybersecurity work uh, workforce out there is is going to be integral because what AI does is it allows us to effectively scan and monitor and report um, a lot greater across the across our organizations. You know, we can we can scan all of our endpoints. We you know. A lot of organizations may have, like, you know, a cyber force of what maybe 10 to 20 people in an organization that's several thousand people. Um, we can't do, we can't go out and scan each one of those manually. That would be impossible. So AI, the adoption of AI is going to be integral in, us, in order for us as cyber, you know, as cyber defenders, to do more with less, you know, with less, do more, um, do more scanning, more, more uh, protecting, more illuminating with less resources. And again, we always talk about we got to do more with less. The only way we're going to do that is with the use of AI. You know, the AI allows us, you know, things like Splunk, things like, uh, you know, ACAS scanners, things like, uh, things that, you know, are, are we can set up um, filters, we can set up scanners, we can set up firewalls, we can set these things up to ping on certain malicious activity. Mm -hmm. But the key to that is 
we have to still stay educated on what the what the APTs, the advanced persistent threats, what they're doing, what their activities are, what their preferred vectors of attack are, and then we can we can adjust our AI scanners to look for that activity. So it's going to be this marriage between the AI and an educated cyber force. Mm -hmm. So it's all about scalability and automatism to join. So scalability, I mean, you know, with AI, it allows us to have that scalability to, you know, we can, we can throw, you know, thousands of endpoints at a single, you know, Splunk server, and we can scan those, you know, every day and uh, allow us to illuminate you know, any kind of you know, uh, failed logon attempts, repeated failed logon attempts, um, unknown logons, um, any, you know, uh, uh, changing of, uh, you know, changing of files out, you know, or transfer of files uh, in off hour times. So that allows us to do 24-7 monitoring on our systems with a workforce that, you know, typically operates between the hours of eight and five. Mm, exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank Did you Did that answer much. your question? Yes, perfect. thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Any others? I wonder how um, the other side is using AI. Um, Oh, we're using AI. Of course, how, how our malicious AI? our malicious actors are definitely using AI. Um, whether it's you know, you, do you think they're sending out millions of email addresses or emails one by one? No, they're they're putting them through these you know automated filters. They're scraping internet sites you know with these with web crawlers that are scraping out email addresses and populating these spam you know these spam address books, and they're sh they're shooting you know they're basically shooting wide and hoping for one shot to hit. Um, so they you know. Yeah, they have they do the same thing you know just because we're using ai and we're doing these things we cannot assume that they don't do the same thing you know if we assume that then we're we've already failed yeah we, we actually know that they already use ex some kind of quality uh, security or qu quality uh, insurance for all oh, the, yeah. for put all the available av scanner endpoint system and their and, and they are testing against those, yes, uh, yep. against the latest patch alert, and then they are automatically uh, put this into the internet. So that's a very sophisticated adversary, absolutely. Let's look at the solar. Let's look at the solar winds compromise back in December that was reported. I mean, mm. they were, you know, the reason they got into solar winds is because they understood how solar winds worked. They understood yes. the AI behind it, and they were able to get into the supply chain and compromise it. Do you think that is? We have also a lot of talks about, okay, that was a time 10 years ago where the, 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 the script kid is, uh, was, <laughs> they're, they're still out, of course. Yeah, everyone could, yeah. could do easily have a, a malware, a toolbox, and, and, and but, but these kind of sophisticated attacks with the end, like you said, it's not an antivirus anywhere, no chance. You are have, uh, downloading payload, you are morphizing, you are changing your, um, your the polymorphic codes. code, yeah. In 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 the in the, in the in your in your RAM and and then you are download again some uh, so it's it's a very high so it's a, it's actually a weapon system. Um, yeah. We think that it's, it's it's okay. You have a strong cyber criminal group, and we all know that the organized I say classic uh, criminals are entering uh, this this game. But uh, with this sophisticated. Um, I think we could be very, very much sure that these are national. Um, uh, I don't know whether it is counterintelligence uh, organization. Nation state actors, yeah. Exactly. Uh, otherwise, I cannot see that we have any chance. There are some reports, and, and you've got better inside yep. than, than we, normal civilian, but that North Korean, and so they are financing their state or other uh, countries. Otherwise, I could not imagine that. Just even a pure a group of high intelligence um, uh, engineers are able to construct such such kind of of systems. Yeah. To so so to answer that question, I can actually uh, give you a relate a story from personal experience. Um, I was in the in the Air Force back in the early '90s as a as a cryptologic linguist. So my job was to speak. I, I spoke foreign languages. I was my my area was it was an Eastern European language. Um, our, my target was actually a hacker group out in Eastern Europe that there was a university that was actually recruiting highly skilled computer smart people that they would recruit out of their school systems through STEM, through science, technology, engineering, mathematics programs. 
Mm -hmm. They were tending them to this university. I'm trying to be vague because I don't know how much I can say in this forum, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but they were sending them to this university, and the university was training you know, in their in their information technology you know degree program was actually a hacker training bed, and they were using that hacker training bed. The hackers that they were producing out of that system were then recruited, were were, were into these were in hacker cells that were then selling their services not only to the criminal element but also to the nation state actors as well. So the nations, you know, the, the 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 Eastern European nations were were basically spending money into this so they could buy hacker time in order to hack against the Department of Defense and the U.S. military. Mm. So what you were saying is absolutely true. It it's not these kiddie scripters and that that are out there. These are highly organized criminal elements that are training entire hacker cells to do specific missions, specific you know, against specific target sets, and then they're selling off that time to whether it's nation states, whether it's criminal organizations, uh, whether it's corporate espionage. Now, yeah. that stuff is out there and for sale. So we can't okay. think that our cyber forces in, you know, in big business and in, within the U.S. military or the, you know, or, or, or the you know, European military for, you know, cyber forces, we are yeah. not the top of the food chain anymore. You know, we, we have to combat as if all of those players out there are peer or near peer actors. Yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, I still we have the the power more or less in the large enterprise organization. We have SOCs. Uh, uh, you guys have in the military, but the, all the small and mid market business companies they are vulnerable. Yeah, they are. Uh, yeah, complete. yeah. The mom and pop shops out there that you know they can only rely so much on what's commercially available yes. to protect. Yeah. What um, I've seen as a trend is how uh, you say that that. They are equal uh, yeah. to, to, to your level of, of um, expertise uh, within the US military. But what I see in Europe as a general is that we are still so far behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the only way we on can topic get of cybersecurity. Yeah. We we and doing forums like this and having you know IC squared uh, you know host these things allows us to um, create the collaboration from a from our peers you know whether mm -hmm. we're military whether we're private industry whether we're in the healthcare industry or you know, uh, you know local or state government having that's why I belong to Doc CISO and a couple of of other CISO organizations is I go out to these you know luncheons and forums and stuff that they have. And I'm able to get out there and ask the questions like you're asking. It's like, well, how are you guys combating this? What are you guys seeing? What is your what attack vectors are you seeing these APTs come in on? And then I take that back to my organization and I share that. And so that's hopefully through these kind of forums, these lunch and learning sessions, we can do that. And that's I think that's the whole goal here from ISC squared. Mm. Um, I put up my contact information. If anybody has, you know, individual questions, you want to hit me up afterwards. That's my email, um, the commercial line for for my desk or DSN. If you're in the military system. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah. Pending um, any further questions, anyone? One last question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. From me. Um, biometrics, as security has taken a, a front page. Uh, yeah, headline basically uh, <laughs> lately. How how do you think that combats the data? So biometrics problems? is hard because I mean it's part of a of a multi-factor authentication methodology, and I think that's mm -hmm. great. Uh, it can't be our only factor of authentication, though. I think biometrics coupled with another, you know, like a PIN number or some, you know, some it's something what what they call it. It's something you something you know, something you are, and something you. I can't okay. remember the third. Yeah. For, 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 for instance, they, yeah. they've started with, with biometric scanning on airports, mm -hmm. right? Where you right. don't have to put down your your boarding card anymore, but just can pass through a, a self-boarding device by being right. scanned. And it's yeah. It's hard. Biometric I mean biometric it's it it, because you're talking about collecting because biometrics not only is a an, as an identifying factor for the individual, but you know some people can argue that well it's it, it's it's personal healthcare information too because it's my biometric it's me it's who I am, yeah. um, so you can't collect that. So it depends on the interpretation. Um, 
I personally think having the dual factor to you know, not only using your, print, your thumbprint, but then once the thumbprint is identified, then you have a pin that's associated to it. So you have that multi-factor. Mm -hmm. um, only limiting it to one factor in there, you know, it's, it's, it's no better than just using a password alone. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. And I think we're coming up on our hour. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll just jump in real quick. I really appreciate it, Andrew. Thanks for, uh, you know, giving us all this uh, this talk. And it was a, a lot of really good information. I really appreciate you taking the time to put this together and uh, doing this for the chapter. Um, for everyone else on the line, uh, thanks for dialing in, for reserving your, you know, your and uh, joining us for this. I know, you know, uh, just uh, – a quick tidbit about what's going on with the uh, chapter. We are, you know, still looking at virtual meetings for the next, uh, I don't know, you know, couple of months until things change. We're, we're, you know, uh, trying to be responsible with regards to the stuff that the garrison is telling us to do and what we think is safe and where we can meet. So hopefully within the next 12 months, we'll get back into something more normal and uh, be able to meet in person again and uh, eat lunch together. But, you know, uh, we're, of course, we're, we're monitoring that situation and, uh, you know, all of our uh, communication to that regard will go out in emails and on the Facebook page. So if you haven't uh, followed us on Facebook, we do try to push everything that goes out on email uh, there. So, you know, keep an eye out on there. We do have a couple of uh, things in the hopper, so hopefully we'll have a couple of more of these virtual talks, try to get to one or two a month at least. And uh, just a heads up, uh, this summer we are looking at having uh, elections again. So uh, if you are interested in a board position, I think we've got a lot of stuff opened up. I know I will be PCSing in the summer. I think Andre leaves the following winter. And uh, there are just some, some openings that are out there. So if you're interested in anything at all, please reach out to myself or any of the other board members and we can let you know what all is involved. And we really appreciate the help. You know, it takes a, a lot of work to get this going and we're, uh, you know, uh, just kind of suffering through this COVID thing along with every other organization and person out there. So uh, again, we appreciate you um, joining us and appreciate any assistance as usual, we'll be pushing all the CPEs and stuff up to ISC squared. But again, thank you to Andrew and Andre for organizing this. And we'll, uh, you know, be back in touch with everyone by email and Facebook. Hey, Simon, quick question. Uh, there was a, yeah. a question in the, in the forum about access to the slide deck. I had sent it forward. You, can you guys send that out to, the, to everybody that was on here if they, if they wanted it? Yeah, and I believe um, someone was recording probably. We can probably make the, I think we make yeah. all the, yeah. Yeah, this yeah, recording so, will be available. Okay, yeah. So, again, like on Facebook and email, we'll make all, you know, where all that, if you don't know where to find it, we can make all that uh, available for everyone. But it's usually on the website. So, oh, yeah, the website, too, besides the social media and uh, whatnot. So, yeah. So I'm going to take this moment to unmute everyone. And if everyone could, um, I guess that's not working. If everybody could unmute and give uh, Andrew Smith a round of applause, that would be. Thanks, everybody. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Good job, Andrew. Thank you. And um, I'm going to stop recording now, and this will conclude the uh, first Lunch and Learn for 2021. Thank you, and see. You, hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye then. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, Carol. Bye, everybody.